Let's talk about digital identity, the podcast connecting identity and business. I am your host, Oscar Santolaya. Hello and thanks for joining. Today we are starting the new year 2020 and hope you had a nice time ending the 2019 and now we are back and we have a fabulous guest to start this year, a guest who has an amazing career in technology, in cybersecurity, and today she's embarked a lot in projects for combined technology with social impact. And a lot of that is also related to digital identity. Monique Morrow is president and co-founder of The Humanized Internet, a non-profit organization focused on addressing the need to control our identities, as well as providing digital identity for those individuals most underserved. The belief in the social good of technology with embedded ethics has guided Monique's extensive work with blockchain, especially its applicability to education and credentialing, as well as other industries including healthcare, insurance, and Internet of Things. Monique is also president of the Vetri Foundation in Switzerland. Among other accolades, Monique has been recognized in the industry for her tireless focus on social good. Monique was selected as one of the top digital shapers 2018 in Switzerland. And this year, One World Identity recognized Monique as one of the top 100 influencers in identity for 2019. Hi, Monique. Hello, Oscar. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about an important topic. Thanks a lot. The pleasure is mine, truly. And I really want to hear this latest project you have. I told a bit about you, but that's not enough. So I would like to hear more. So tell me a bit of your journey, how your career led you to this world of digital identity. Sure. I mean, look, um, first of all, I should say a happy new year and 2020 to everyone, because I do believe 2020 is going to be the year for uh, digital identity and even more so self-sovereign identity. Mm -hmm. So the journey is the following, where I got very much involved in this space and it goes into how I got involved in terms of blockchain and credentialing. What we were finding is that identity is a very important component, especially if you're talking about people who don't have one, maybe because of a crisis, maybe because of war, uh, whatever the, the situation is, and they don't have their uh, papers anymore. Identity is a very uh, multifaceted theme because it also footprints to culture, but it also footprints to how you are perceived and what rights you have when you come into a country or into an organization or wherever. So the issue around digital identity is really around you know, what happens, what is digital, what is acceptable, what are the exact components of that? And I think what really fostered that journey, which we'll discuss during you know, the actual components, which we'll discuss during the course of this interview, was in fact when I first established and co-founded the Humanized Internet, which is a Swiss-based nonprofit in Switzerland. And I have a co-founder based in Toronto, Canada, and a co-founder who is really the heart of the story, who is a former refugee. And refugees is just mm -hmm. illegal status. He's, he's a person, an individual who happened to come from the Middle East and particularly Syria and was studying in Greece and literally lost his passport, literally lost his passport. Mm -hmm. And although it, he could be seen in the system as a student, he wasn't in the system. And it didn't matter that he had documents that were on Google Drive. They just simply were not going to be accepted. And there was no way for him to go back to a war situation mm -hmm. to go back to a country that is at war in this particular case, Syria, and he would have his life in peril. So it really fostered the story about how can we actually have a, a world where we can have and be in control of our, our digital identity sets such that they could be accepted by other organizations. And that's what got me very much involved in identity overall, digital identity, self-sovereign identity. And I, I have colleagues who have been working in this space for many, many years. So it's been a, a journey, but now we're looking at, you know, how do we deal with credentialing? So it's become something of, you know, I don't talk about it at a theoretical perspective. I talk about it in really concrete examples and concrete examples, working with people who are, who are the center of, of the stories that 
in narratives that we read about every day. Yeah, this is a very concrete example and it's hard to believe that uh, someone, you just lose your passport and you don't have an identity. That's, it's really hard to believe that. You know, it's an incredible because um, it's just like a scene out of, out of a movie. We, we're actually published in a book called The Humanized Internet. And uh, the tenets around the humanized internet is not only around digital identity but it's and, and control, but it's also around the, the notion of ethics and technology and uh, the whole issue about how do we actually put some governance model around it. But it was like a movie for him. And he couldn't go to a consulate or an embassy because there is none. It's mm. country at war. And so, you know, he was extremely in a very stressful situation. It is a situation now he's in living in Germany, he's living in Berlin. And I think that's, uh, he's contributing to society in, in that sense. He's a software engineer in development. Mm -hmm. But that journey uh, he represents is a story of many. We have to think about questions. What happens if there's a terrible earthquake? What happens mm. if there's a fire? What happens if your organization is no longer exists? How do you actually credential, but also how do you actually get a component of digital identity such that it carries a weight and that you are under control? So digital identity as a topic has several components here. One is where you have some level of control. And I'll put that in quotes. The other is what is being profiled about you? This gets into the story of companies actually making money and profits out of your identity or your presence mm -hmm. on the internet where you're not involved in that exchange. The only exchange, the involvement that you have is that you're given quote unquote free services, which it really aren't free at the end. And so uh, your presence is being, and you're all over the net is being sort of profiled or, or used and used for, mm -hmm. could be used you know, for marketing purposes and it could be used for nefarious purposes. So we have several com aspects of this notion of digital identity that moves to self sovereign identity, that moves to some point of how do we now go into the 21st century and beyond and look at what does control look like? What does a digital apple steel mean? And how is it going to be accepted by my many countries and organizations? So if I take a step further, Oscar, mm -hmm. which gets, you know, because I'm in the blockchain world and we talk about that a little more, but, you know, credentialing is an opportunity here. How do you have universities, maybe in Helsinki or so on, that actually use this technology to actually provide you with a hash or a key which is referenceable on the blockchain on the public blockchain by the validating organization in this particular case university forever there because in case something that happens uh, at least you can reference it and if you are a refugee or if you're somebody in a, a person that happens to be stuck in a humanitarian crisis what you want to be able to do, even though we, you know, you can use certain technologies like artificial intelligence to actually have predictability, a predictor exam. We think Oscar studied computer science, and then have a certification, a credential given uh, that is by the validating organization, a new organization that is referenceable at the, at the blockchain. But having said that, if you are resettling, which is a legal language, and you're moving, for example, from Jordan or from whatever country to a receiving country, let's say Sweden, for example, you want the receiving organization to accept your credentials so that you can work. The problem is when it's no longer acceptable by the receiving organization, it takes um, people spend quite a bit of money, 50, 60,000, 90,000 euros or more to recertify and credential. And that weighs on the social system because what happens is they end up trying to get help from the social system and it plays out to, unfortunately, to a, ne a negative political narrative. Yes. And how, how big is the problem in terms of how many people uh, worldwide are affected or potentially affected by this lack? I mean, you know, the numbers are going up. I mean, uh, I think if we look at the UNHCR report, uh, it's gone from 65 million to 73 million thereabouts. I mean, circa displaced people. Mm -hmm. We can make a correlation to certain things that are happening to this displacement. It's not just war. You know, the climate crisis is one example. People are, have, are migrating. There's the migration component of it. Mm -hmm. There's also displacement overall because of these crises. And People are seeking humanitarian aid. The thing of it is, is that with that, it gives people have a human right to work. In most cases, they really want to work. Mm -hmm. They yes. want a quote unquote better life. 
And so, uh, you know, you're dealing with all, it's a very complex uh, situation, but I think that an example that's often cited is the Rohingya Mm -hmm. tragedy and crisis. And so people are stuck in these horrific camps and, you know, they want to be recognized as a people. They, they don't want to be called a refugee. By the way, they don't, people don't like that term. They are a people who want to contribute to, to some extent to society. And what happens in a case like this, and this is why technology can be an enabler for digital identity and looking at provenance of, you, of where you're coming from, et cetera, is that they, because there's no recognition, because they're, um, you don't have, uh, maybe you have some level of recognition from UNA, UNHC or you're in somebody's database, mm-hmm. you are subjected to human trafficking. And human trafficking is a huge humanitarian crisis that we have to, you know, it's at all levels. And it happens, it's happening in our own backyards because people, what happens is any kind of whatever identity that they have, even if they don't have any, when they don't have any, they're even more vulnerable. So it is incumbent upon us as as a society and a group of technologists to actually work together with governments and and organizations to actually see how we can uh, take the issue at a level where we can have recognition digitally, right? And it'll be uh, forever uh, with us. And so with an example that I get, uh, I think 2020 is going to be a year year of self-sovereign identity, SSI. Mm -hmm. And there you are in the middle. It's portable. Uh, Your credentials are portable. You have the right to selectively disclose parts of what you want to disclose about yourself and actually look at where that data is going. That gets into privacy, that gets into how the data is being used, and so on. And I think that we're going to see more and more of uh, selective disclosure, the notion of self-sovereign identity becoming more of a mainstream at the end of the day, and especially for 2020 moving forward. Yes, definitely. It's a really big problem, as you described pretty well. So what about the humanized internet as a project? You, you already, of course, say something about that, but tell us the well, what is the... Status. Yeah, so we are we started out as we are three people and, and as an association, it's an association as recognized in, in Switzerland. It's nonprofit, and uh, fundamentally, what we have been doing um, from a perspective, one of the big projects is really amplifying uh, some of the issues we've been amplifying, at least the medium, and actually in our forthcoming publication. Having said that, the other issue is we're looking, you know, for example, I'm, I'm wanting to work with some universities here in Switzerland to look at how we solve for the issue of storage of our credentials, not an essential data, it's something that should be distributed. And how do we have this notion of digital keys or what we call lock boxes? That's something that I think that is still, it's a very hard computer science problem to solve for, but I think it's something that we're very interested in solving for because everything can be carried. If I have um, a trezor in a bank or a vault, but that gets destroyed, at least I have some notion of where I hold certain data or certain credentials or something about my, not only identity, but about values or something that I store in a digital format such that they it's distributed and such that I may have something of a notion of digital keys that I can go with uh, members of my family. And so if there is an incident that occurs, there would be, a, let's say, an event flag that's sent out and there would be a lock, right? And I think that we need to solve for something that is at that level. It's something that we've been thinking about for some time as a project. We have um, been looking at, you know, the whole notion of, could we make having a, some sort of uh, an identifier, if you will, decentralized identifier as a humanized internet, but more importantly, within the context of self-sovereign identity as, let's say, a standard, that would be fantastic. We realize that there are a lot of organizations, and I should say quite a bit of organizations involved in some level of identity or digital identity. It's crowded space, but it also means that there's a opportunity here. And so for us, we're looking at the next level of problems that need to be solved. So in summary, it's really about what does a digital lockbox look like and how do I distribute digital keys to close members of family and friends? So at this point, the project is designing this platform? Yes. So the goal is to have in a 
few years? Uh, Yes, it's a process to design it and work with an ecosystem of organizations, particularly universities, to look at how we can do that together. Yes, and in the how do you envision at the time this this platform is already operational? Uh, who will be well, the main uh, actors that somehow maintain that? Like, let's say, government or university, university, universities can be also companies. How do you see it? I would say that uh, the ecosystem would involve universities. Mm -hmm. I mean, we want this to be a standard globally, right? You cannot do it in the absence of government. I mean, organizations. Mm -hmm. It's something that you have to take government organizations along a journey. You know, this gets into regulatory tech and how they have to understand what it is they regulate. But they have to be involved uh, to some extent because if they're, you're talking about digital keys, they have to recognize them, right? Something has to be recognized. That which is portable has to be recognized by an authority. And so you have to have something that's hybrided there. And I think also public-private, or I mean, so you're getting into what I will call multilateral relationships here or, or an ecosystem that gets built out. What we're trying to avoid is, is an over-centralization that breaks the model uh, that we're talking about in terms of self-sovereign yes. identity. You want it to be absolutely, to some extent, decentralized or hybrid decentralized where you don't have an over-centralization that occurs. Because here's the thing. This is very important from a development perspective, from a platform and principle perspective. So that's what we're looking at. It should be for, even though we, you think it's B2B, but I think at the end of the day, it's going to be C, B2B. You know, it's consumer, a business, a business to consumer. And the consumer actually is going to be in the middle at the end. I think the consumer is going to be, I believe, strongly the consumer, the citizen, the person should be in the middle of that. So there will be some actors building components of this platform and then it becomes uh, available for everybody. So for instance, uh, what would be the, from the end user point of view, there will be an, an application or just a web service. So, so what would the individuals interact? Well, I mean, you can have, you can download an app, API. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's going to be, uh, I mean, it's got to be usable. We know that people, have, for some extent, have uh, smartphones or mobile phones. Even you know, for folks who have been displaced, they do have some level yes. of technology at basic level. So I think it's going to be something that they can should be able to download, you know, from an app store and be able to use. That would be from the user experience perspective. And they will put the security knobs that they want to have on it. They will put what they want to disclose on this, uh, et cetera. That's the way I would envisage and what we're envisaging. And then we'll have certain keys where they want to store the keys, how they want to store the keys, and uh, to how they want to share it with what members of their friends and family organization. And then, of course, we get into you know this whole lockbox type of model. But from my perspective and from the perspective that we're looking at from the design, it's, it's really at an app level. Mm -hmm. The thing of it is easy to use, complexity is hidden, it's portable. And, you know, when you talk to people who, who have been fleeting terrible situations, they always had a mobile phone with them. Mm -hmm. That yes. was their GPS. That's everything for them. You know? And so a mobile phone is like the basic tool that, that people should have, we know that we'll be using. And in some cases, there's been studies to suggest out of, uh, particularly out of Germany, that mobile phone for people in the refugee community were considered extensions of their bodies. They couldn't do anything without it. Mm -hmm. And once this, uh, this platform is operational, again, how this will self-sustain? So who, because this have a cost of, of running all this platform. Yes. I mean, I, I think the funding, I think that uh, you're getting actually to funding in the business model itself, which is a fair question. You know, we, we've been thinking about how that could be because it has to be something that um, people will want, so they will desire it. And I think the funding is going to be something that we have to look at whether or not it's um, public-private funding, you know, uh, whether you, if we're in the EU, is this something that the EU would be interested in funding or having a funding model for it? Would it be a World Bank opportunity? So because you're talking about one part of it is humanitarian. Would it be that? We're looking at different models for actual funding and continued funding, right? The thing of it is, is that what we would like to have is a community working. You know, it's just, I think the model that was very interesting is if you look at the way Hyperledger has developed, right, in the, in the world of 
of technology sets and specifically around identity, et cetera, hyperledger Aries and so on. I think when you have a community actually contributing to it and actually making sure that there is a continued contribution, it sort of self funds itself. It sort of self feeds, right? And that's where we want to be able to go to where it becomes a standard at the end of the day. But I think the models are going up for funding are going to depend and I think there, you'll see we can envisage multifaceted mm-hmm. funding models. World Bank, as an example, um, right. is, is one that comes up immediately. And also some of the uh, European Union types of projects, especially when we think about H2020 or beyond, you know, those examples, those become interesting funding models too. The book, uh, The Humanized Internet, is already published, correct? No, no, oh, it's no about yet. to be published. So we've been working on the draft itself and we're looking at um we have also external contributors so we are about to publish it and we expect that to be uh we had it uh noted for the end of this year but it's probably be the first quarter of next year for sure because there's quite a bit that we've had to actually um make sure that we're we've updated it and plus we want to have uh, somebody very very special to write the forward for the book or to endorse the book mm-hmm. the book is actually um it's a reflection of quite a bit of the Conversations that we're having and uh, with personal journeys and it spawns between, you know, what's, we have an example with um, folks who have been working with the Rohingyas, especially when we're talking about e-government as a service. We have a colleague who's in the entertainment space and talking about the role of, let's say, ethics and also privacy, particularly that which you are in control of. In that space, you know, what's happening with when you know, we have algorithms, when we have actually, we go out of control, we're not within a control, and we don't have any, what I'll call a framework of governance in place. So we have it from a all multifaceted uh, perspective, and we have uh, examples about how to use blockchain for credentialing. I mean, you know, I believe in knowing what I don't know, I don't know. I went off and got a degree in this space, and my degree is actually credentialing the blockchain. So it's um, very multifaceted, and uh, we're very excited about it coming out. Okay, excellent. So coming in this in this first month of the new year, mm-hmm. yeah, fabulous. Really looking forward to to see the release and spread the word about that. Thank you. I know one of the other projects you are involved today is this Vetri Foundation. Could you tell us something? Vetri Foundation. So I'm the president of the Vetri Foundation. So let me, uh, this is uh, one where you can actually look at how you download the app. This is something that exists today. Mm-hmm. The Vetri Foundation was born out of, uh, we had actually gone through an entire compliance. Uh, we had uh, crypto uh, currency, which are uh, valid coins that were created. We are the nonprofit arm of what is Vetri and what has been also Perceivist.ch. Uh, very strict compliance that had gone through uh, at least two years ago. The foundation was born literally December of a year ago. So as a foundation, what we have now is you have a phone, we have a mobile app, and the tenant is you should be the person actually selectively disclosing how you want to share your data or, you know, if you're a company, how you deal with market research and surveys. And by the way, you are incentivized with valid coins. You can tr- Valid is traded on the internet. I mean, you can go look at valid uh, cryptocurrency. And so what it uh, is, is that rather than you being sort of the quote unquote, which is something we hear about, the product of big companies, you are actually in the middle. You are selectively disclosing. And or if you are a, a company or an organization, you're very interested in, in market data And that becomes a research that becomes very, very compelling for companies as well as consumers. And you're incentivized through the use of a of this token or this coin called Valid. As the foundation, we are nonprofit. We don't take any percentage of the proceeds per se, depending if you're a business. That is something that we negotiate. But as a consumer, we don't. And we don't hold your data. Uh, your data is actually, it's frictionless. You are selectively disclosing. It's what you are wanting to care about. Do I care about healthcare? Am I going to be willing to fill out a survey about healthcare? Do I want to know where my data is going to go that from that survey? And it's nice to be able to receive a valid token on, on for the attention that I, you know, for a minute of my time. And oh, by the way, 
I am choosing to look at what categories of topics I, I'm interested in. So it's very targeted for you. And for this, the organization have to agree to use this service or? Well, no, I mean, the organization, the thing of it is, is your incentive, it's gamified, right? So if you download the app, I mean, if you, you can go look at the app or you can look at it. By the way, it's either on your phone or you can have it on a desktop. You can see how it goes. You can see the entire video about what we're, the foundation is about. What is very critical is we are a nonprofit. And so we will look at attention to projects uh, that are within, you know, looking at how we grow the veterinary ecosystem. And that's very important. We want to grow that veterinary ecosystem to spawn the use of the valid token. And also to spawn the use of this engagement between, let's say, data owner and let's say a data provider and or if you are a business to look at because people want that targeted data, how clean that data is. Because also if the data source is not a clean data source, it means nothing. And so this goes down to market research at a business level. But for the consumer, it's very, very valuable. And for, we believe that this is the direction, it's a strategic direction that um, the market wants to move to and certainly consumers want to move to. Mm. Here's a thesis too. I think this is something that we always quote as part of Vetri. And even when we're talking about the humanized internet, the problem you have when you have centralized data stores is that they are open for hack. Mm. We yes. don't see a day that has gone by mm. where data has been just stolen. So we have to look at ways to mitigate one centralization of data such that because it is valuable that it's stolen. And so that's where we have to look at distributed models uh, where there is not very minor, I would say, hybrid centralization. Uh, we would like to see full decentralization, decentralization at some point in time, a distributed model at some point in time. And secondly is, you know, big companies are certainly profiting from you. And so why can't you get a share of that profit? And why can't it be, you know, you getting not only the share, but you actually controlling where your data goes? Yeah, correct. Uh, definitely strong reasons to have to check it out, this, this model as well. Mm -hmm. As many people listening to this podcast are also into business, running in services or implementing for others. From the ideas that we have been sharing today, um, what's something that people who are building e services, maintaining e services should keep in mind? What? Yeah, that's a great question, Oscar. I think that we should have uh, an industry model around the fair treatment of data as businesses. And of course, this is something I had spoken about in Berlin a couple of months ago in October about how do we as an industry come together and standardize on fair treatment of data. Of course, that assumes that the source of that data is also fairly clean. I'll put that in quotes. Mm -hmm. Because the problem we have is we're metadata of metadata. You know, we're just metadata. And so we as businesses, I mean, especially in the business community, is looking at do we have a standard now on fair treatment of data? And it's not about reading a bunch of legal documents on GDPR or privacy laws, et cetera, such that, you know, community members and, and consumers and, and sometimes business people just don't have the time of day, their attention to, to go through that because it's sort of this legalese. Mm -hmm. However, it's looking at how do you have fair treatment of data just as you have fair trade, right? Fair treatment of data. And I think having that is, is very important. Here's the thing is that it's not about here we changed our privacy laws and you have to kind of sort of agree. It's really getting people to have an interactive model with consumers And citizens, I think that's more important. They need to be part of it rather than being sort of a subject. They need to be in the center of it. Uh, I think that's more important. So, so businesses need to be careful. They need to self-state it. And they need to uh, say, look, we want you to be part of the Fair Treatment of Data program, which I think needs to be standardized as an industry. And uh, this is not about you being, you know, sort of the subject. It's about you actually controlling the narrative. That, I think, will be very palatable for consumers and citizens at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Fair treatment data, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely an excellent idea to, for anybody who is building e-services uh, platforms to consider. Monique, now I would like to ask you something for anybody, individuals, anybody who can protect their digital identity. Could you share some, some tip 
Yeah, I mean, that's a great, uh, you know, once again, Oscar, you're full of wonderful questions and I enjoy the, the dialogue and discussion thus far. I think it's very important that be careful about your presence on the internet. It's forever there. You leave mm-hmm. a forensic dust, that's forever there. We have communities that love the, inst- you know, it's Instagram and it's selfies and, and so on and so forth. But we have to make sure that you can never, you know, you have to be careful about how you're, you know, presenting your digital self over the internet. I do believe, and I always quote this, that if you go and get a driver's license, you have to have so many tests and examinations. Mm-hmm. But I do believe that it's important for companies and organizations, even down to buying a mobile phone, that they walk you through the privacy. How do you protect yourself? Various privacy examples and knobs. Mm-hmm. And be responsible. I think it's an ecosystem of accountability and responsibility. They sell you a product. Um, they should be able to say, here, let us walk you through some of the basic privacy that you have to care about. Having dialogues like this is very, very important. I think uh, going to just hygienics uh, are very key. Having everything open on your phone is something that we have to be concerned about because your phone is everything. I mean, it's hackable and we're hackable. So we have to take very care. It's raised awareness and ask the questions around what are the basic things that we should uh, turn, you know, where we have privacy. The two-factor authentication is, is an example. You know, getting into that would be an example where you start to set your security knobs in place and make sure that you have some level of the two-factor authentication as, as very basic. These are the things that I think we need to do as an industry. Yeah, it's, it's excellent point. The, the first thing you say, especially when you say that uh, the manufacturers who sell you a mobile phone, they somehow assume that you know how to protect yourself and have some basics about uh, data protection, which is not true. And actually, some of these companies are uh, somehow accomplices with uh, serv- the, the internet services who are misusing everybody's data. So it's a certain point. Yep, that is correct. Well, thanks a lot, Monique, for this conversation. As you have very interesting projects that are very worth to follow and keep going, please tell us how we can find more about these projects and about yourself. Sure. I mean, I look, I have a uh, personal website at www.moniquemorrow.com. You can also reach us at the Humanized Internet website and also at the Vetri Global website. Um, so there are multiple websites where you can see common pattern of what I had just discussed. You know, I do have a Twitter feed at uh, Monique J. Morrow. And also, uh, certainly, you know, just uh, engaging actively in the conversation through these websites. It'd be great. Again, thanks a lot, Monique. Uh, I will be following your projects in this new year and hope that they really crystallize, go mainstream, and because they are really solving very important problems today. Thank you, Oscar. And I can't uh, stress more that 2020 is the year of really cool projects that are going to come up and in terms of self-sovereign identity it's the time now and um, i thank you for the opportunity to have a wonderful dialogue and look forward we know this is an ecosystem play look forward to working with many organizations and companies and governments along the way it was a pleasure all the best thank you oscar thanks for listening to this episode of let's talk about digital identity produced by ubisecure Stay up to date with episode at ubisecure.com slash podcast or join us on Twitter at ubisecure and use the hashtag LTADI. Until next time, 